Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, my guest this week is uh, is a tremendous person. Um, if you follow football like I have for the past, I don't know how many years, and you understand the history of the Dallas Cowboys, and you, uh, in, and at times, watched uh, a certain reality show, then you'll know this guy and, and this man that I'm about to bring in and introduce. Uh, Jimmy Johnson was a two-time Super Bowl winning uh, coach for the Dallas Cowboys, uh, won a national championship with the Miami Hurricane, uh, and as a member of the College Football Hall of Fame. But more importantly, there's only been 22 coaches that have been inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. That would be the great Jimmy Johnson. Oh, by the way, Coach, people are still asking you to come back and coach the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> that's how long it's been. I don't know how many times that's probably been said to you, but after all these years, I still want you back. Hey, first of all, thanks and foremost for, for joining me. Well, Tony, I, you know, really, I, I owe a lot to a lot of people, including yourself. Uh, you know, going into the Pro Football Hall of Fame is really due to the great play of the outstanding players I had and the great assistant coaches. But, but really, it's you know, for all of the success that I had over my career, I went to College Football Hall of Fame because of the players and assistant coaches. Now I might've had something to do with bringing them, <laughs> that group together. Just also, a little bit. <laughs> hey, Tony, the only person that's ever gone into all three, I'm in the broadcasting hall of fame due to Terry Bradshaw and Kirk Menifee, Michael Strahan, Howie Long, Jay Glazer. And so, you know, in this sport and, and in our endeavors, you know, you know, we don't ever do anything by ourselves. You know, we do it because of the people that we're surrounded by. And I was fortunate enough to be around a bunch of great players and great assistant coaches. And I failed to mention, obviously, your broadcasting career <laughs> with uh, Fox for so many years. Uh, I mean, you've, you've done a, gr you do a great job. And people love your opinion. So congratulations. I mean, you're you know, your resume is, is, is endless. I mean, you, you start looking at what you've done, not only in your personal life, but as a coach. I mean, it's amazing. But then once you made the transition to broadcasting, um, you know, it, 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 take me back because we all saw it unfold on national TV when you found out that you, uh, that you were going to go into the Hall of Fame. And I mean, we, it, it, the, all the players that have played for you, I mean, we just felt like that we were part of that umbilical cord as far as your emotion. But I mean, and I know you've been asked this so many times, but what was that moment like? Was it, was it like finally winning a Super Bowl or a national championship? I know it had to be different type of feeling, but uh, what, what did you experience when you found out that you were going at? Well, well, Tony, it was a surprise because, you know, I, of course I knew, you know, a lot of the people on the selection committee, uh, Bill Belichick and I are, are really close friends and, and Bill said, hey, you're in. You're going to get in. You know, you know, I don't have the final numbers, but, you know, just listening to everybody on the committee, uh, you know, you're going to get in. So you really don't know until David Baker actually tell you. And so, you know, I thought that, you know, maybe David Baker might come out on the pregame show and make the announcement. Well, he didn't show up on the pregame show. So I said, well, oh, maybe it's yeah. not going to happen. You know, and. And so my producer, uh, Bill Richards, said, uh, you know, Coach, I, I want you to talk about the Seattle defense, you know, at halftime of the game, the Seattle defense versus the Green Bay Packers in a, a particular, you know, route that they ran down the goal line for a touchdown. And he had video for me, and I was all set for that. And, of course, we got 35 million people watching us. So you don't want, you don't want to screw up, you know, explaining the video. So my mind was on this video. I watched it a time or two. I was all set for what I was going to say. And then all of a sudden here at halftime, David Baker walks out. Well, he's a big man. He, he must weigh 450 pounds at least. Yeah, I mean, he looks big. I mean, TV makes it look bigger, but this dude, yeah, he is uh, He's kind of a – he's got a presence to him. <laughs> uh, well, it was overwhelming when he walked out. I stopped breathing. Wow! And so he started telling me about going into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, which I was expecting. And I tried to talk, and I couldn't talk. You know? Yeah. But really, the, when I finally could get some words out, uh, the first thing I said was, "I 
just think of all the great players and the great assistant coaches I had, and they're the reason I'm going into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, it was such a the reaction and everything, which is so on point. And, and look, I, I think they did a great job. It's kind of like keeping a surprise, you know, a surprise birthday or something like that and try to keep it, you know, in secrecy and to be able to pull it off like that and at the last minute. Um, yeah, I had Troy on a couple of weeks ago and we talked about how uh, you picked him to be part of his, the presentation. And, and one of the things he said, and it really makes sense, is that, you know, after you left, you left Dallas, you, you you know, you went into broadcasting, you went to Miami, and then you finally retired. Now you're full into you know, broadcasting full time. He said this is really kind of a moment where in the Dallas Cowboy Nation can really just show their appreciation and see you on the stage and really see you in the moment and really thank you for what you've done. As, like, as I mentioned, as I brought you on, and some people still like saying, bring Jimmy back. I'm like – that's probably never going to happen, but they want success. But does that resonate with you when, when, you know, Troy says that and the fans are able to see you in that moment and be able to really thank you uh, going into something so prestigious, a pro football hall of fame. Well, Tony, you know, Troy and Norv Turner and Dave Wanstead, Tony Wise, Butch Davis, Rich Darrymple, you know, uh, that crew came down here a few weeks ago and, uh, we laughed and we cut up. Uh, in fact, Tony Wise called me this morning. I, I told Tony I was going to be on with you. He said, uh, hey, oh. tell, tell Tony Casillas he's one of my favorite players. <laughs> oh, man, I love all those guys. I saw the picture, and, and, and I'm sure there was a lot of BS going on, a lot of Heinekens and just great, great fellowship. <laughs> well, but we talked and we laughed and we cut up. And, you know, when they left, I texted them. I said, you know what? We were so driven and so obsessed with winning and getting better. You know, when there, I, when I was in Dallas, you know, even after the first Super Bowl, you know, my whole thought process was we got to get more players. And so I hit the road, you know, looking at players and evaluating talent, getting ready for the draft. I said, you know, we, we were so driven back then to get better that we really never slowed down long enough to enjoy, you know, the success. And I said, you know, getting together now at this particular time, it's allowing us to maybe enjoy some of the things that we didn't get to enjoy back then. Uh, but we had a great time. It was great memories, great stories, and reliving <laughs> some of the glory days. Yeah, that's great. So I got to ask you this. I know you're freaking amazingly competitive when it comes to – you know, playing the game of football, but are you as competitive when it comes to fishing? Is it like if no one catches a fish, no one's going <laughs> to eat the whole day? <laughs> you know, I, I actually fish by myself most of the time. I don't like to wait on people. I'm very impatient, as my wife would tell you. Uh, <laughs> uh, she frustrates me, you know, to no end because when I say that we're going to be leaving at 1 o'clock, you know, at 12.30, I start telling her to hurry up. <laughs> You'll and never you change know, that. You know, what you used to say, if you're five minutes early, you're late to the team exactly meeting. Exactly right. I would, close, <laughs> I would close that door five minutes before the meeting started. And if you came trying to get into the meeting uh, at the exact time you weren't going to get in the meeting. So I still operate that way. And well, and and so, yeah, it's, uh, I just, you know, I'm an impatient man, you know, but Fishing wise, uh, you know, whenever I wake up, I go and start the engines and normally I'm by myself. So there's no pressure. If I catch fish, fine. If I don't catch fish, it's not the end of the world. It's peaceful for me and relaxing. Now, if I've got people on board, I am competitive and I feel the <laughs> pressure of catching fish. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, more work when I've got people on board because I do want to catch fish and I am competitive. But when I'm alone, I, I don't worry about it. It's like waking up in the morning, having a cup of coffee. No one's up and it's just you. And you just got this moment to just, you know, decompress and unwind. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, great success in Miami with the, those teams. And, um, and all, you know, the transition to the National Football League, uh, the adaptation, you know, what it takes and uh, to be able to take the, you know, beat – you know, the, the transition over from college to the NFL. Um, and one of the things that I, I 
that I knew, but really didn't when I started doing my research and read more on you. I mean, I know a ton of value, but personally, that whole four three defense that you implemented at Miami and then brought it into the National Football League, that it made it vogue. I mean, th- talk about how the evolution of that started. You had all those great defensive linemen, Jerome Browns, obviously the Russell Maryland, just all these guys that, that played there. But that whole evolution of being able to create that type of the defense. Well, we started running this, this style of defense when I was at University of Pittsburgh. And uh, I brought it with me uh, to Oklahoma State. And we made adjustments with it along the way. Uh, and, and actually, you know, when we, you know, brought it to Dallas, we, you know, played it, of course, at University of Miami. And, uh, I, I remember, uh, you know, George Perlis was the defense coordinator at the Pittsburgh Steelers. And we were running this defense. And, and so I was with him one night and his secondary coach looked at us and said, y'all can't play that kind of defense, you know, at the University of Pittsburgh. You know, here the Steelers coach is telling me this. I said, you know, well, maybe we can't play it. But uh, all I know is we're just beating the hell out of everybody with it. You know? So <laughs> it was pretty well, you know, you're with us all the way. And what's what's really interesting, everybody talks about uh, the Tampa 2. Uh, right. Well, we were playing cover two and two invert, what we call switch and double switch. Mm-hmm. We were playing that uh, you know, about 10 years earlier. <laughs> And we brought it into the NFL. And so it's interesting. I was talking to Bill Parcells about it. And, and Bill says, you know, when you first came in your first year in Dallas, uh, you were playing that switch, double switch, cover two, four, three. And he said, uh, Phil Sims looked at me. They were getting ready for your game. Phil Sims looked at me and says, hey, they're playing that college coverage. <laughs> and Parcells looked at him and says, well, let me tell you what you better study that college coverage because these guys know what in the hell they're doing. Uh, and, and then now everybody, you know, works on it. And Bill Belichick talked to me about it a few years ago. He said, we run a little bit of a version. We try to run it, but you've got to be totally committed to running it all the time, in which is really difficult for players to run all the adjustments that we had. But, yeah, we, we gave people problems. Well, that's why we led the league in defense. Everybody talks about the triplets. And they were great, great players, as you know. Uh, but people don't realize uh, we were number one in the NFL defense. That helped those triplets score those touchdowns. Well, as a defensive player, I remember that, Coach. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, you know, and as I mentioned, the transition to the National Football League, and, you, you know, that first year, we know it was a struggle. And then as you just kind of ramped things up and kind of did things your way, built that, that whole franchise from the ground up with the talent. When did you think that, because I always, I always thought it was interesting in you, the way you sent messages to different people. And, and for me, it was, you know, when I went to Dallas, I reinvented me because I was in the four three, but when did you realize that there's something here that we're building and to be able to be in the national football league after what, three, four years and go to the Super Bowl. When did you decide that the thing was like tilting to the direction that you saw this, plan i mean was that originally something that you had in mind like this this you know this blueprint that you wanted to accomplish well you know obviously we had great success at university of miami you yeah. know, we, we lost two regular season games in four years and and uh playing a national schedule as you know um i mean i i was with bobby bowden and barry switzer uh, one day at the uh, orange bowl uh, ring of honor thing and mm-hmm. And Bobby looked over at Barry and said, Barry, he said, you realize how many national championships we could have won if it hadn't been this o- SOB? <laughs> <laughs> so the only game Oklahoma and Florida State lost in that four-year uh, period was to – I know, Coach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, we had great success. And so I, I go to Dallas, and here I was accustomed to winning all those games. Mm-hmm. And Tom Landry, one of the greatest coaches uh, of all time, well, people don't realize he had three straight losing seasons. Here, here with a great coaching staff, with great Tom Landry, and they were last in the NFL, three and thirteen. Well, the reason why they had three straight losing seasons is the talent level had gone down so far. So there wasn't a lot of talented players, and you know, I was with the guys. I said right off the bat, I said, "Well, Steve Pelor was our quarterback. I traded our starting quarterback." 
to Kansas City, you know, for a, a third round pick. And then I released our leading receiver because, you know, he couldn't outrun me. You know, and, and, and so I knew that we had to upgrade the talent. Yeah. Now, the only player that we had that anybody wanted uh, was Herschel Walker. Yeah, that was, so, that was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I, I just said, well, you know, I, I had drafted Steve Walsh knowing that I was going to trade him. Uh, and I was trying to call around all the different, you know, clubs about trading Steve Walsh. That's how it opened the door with Mike Lynn with Minnesota Vikings. And so anyway, you know, I, I started talking about Herschel Walker and Ernie, of course, he was with the Cleveland Browns and Ernie called and he said, what, you know, would you be interested in trading Herschel Walker? So we actually worked out a deal. Uh, but I said, you know, he wanted me to talk to Art Modell that night and finalize it. Yeah. He said, well, okay. You know, and then I went to Jerry and I said, Jerry, I said, I've got this great, you know, great trade, you know, with Cleveland Browns but I think maybe we can improve it. So I started calling him and I actually had him call a, a Rankin Smith and a couple of owners. And I called Mike Lynn and I told him what I had on the table uh, for Cleveland. And so Mike sent me a fax and Mike thought he was going to, you know, really kind of pull the wool over this college coach's eyes. He sent me five players that, and that really he could uh, do without, you know, Jesse Solomon had a hurt knee, Isaac mm -hmm. Holt was an older player. David Howard was a try hard older player. He could do away with those five players. Uh, and he thought that we would fall in love with them and we wouldn't get the draft picks because you either had to get the players or the picks. Well, I knew right off the bat, I was just going to keep the picks. I didn't want the players. I wanted the picks. And, but I actually orchestrated at a later date to be able to keep a couple of those players plus the picks. And so we, we kind of stockpiled some of these draft picks. We made 51 trades in five years because we knew the talent wasn't, you know, good mm -hmm. enough. And the only way – I told our coaching staff, I said, guys, if we do the old let's take the best player available, I said, we'll be fired after three years because there's yeah. no way you can turn around this team taking the best player available. Uh, and so we stockpiled these draft picks. We ended up getting a bunch of good players. Now, a lot of teams have had picks. But it's not, you know, getting picks. That's not the key. The key is picking the right players. And obviously, we knew the college players. We picked the right players. And, and we started winning. You know, you know, that's one reason why with all those young players, we were the youngest team in the league when we won the Super Bowl. Yeah. But anyway, we upgraded the talent, Tony. And that's why we won games. I mean, how surprised were you, though, when you, you said they're actually going to do this deal? Because that's, I mean, when you look at hindsight, in hindsight, as you mentioned, you still got to go get the players, right? But how surprised you were like, we're going to get all that for one player and that being Herschel Walker? You know what? People uh, point to that one trade, and, and obviously it, it helped us. But right. the end result was about three or four players. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we got three or four players for a guy that was a pro bowler. Um, you know, really, you know, but, like Steve Walsh, we got a one, two, and a three for Steve Walsh. Yeah. Um, now, that caused a few problems because I had to walk such a, a tightrope that first year. We weren't going to win any games anyway. We only won one game. And so I wasn't concerned about it. I started bringing players in and out, just evaluating talent. Mm -hmm. and, but I couldn't – I really couldn't go to Troy and say, hey, you're our guy forever and ever. Uh, because that would hurt Steve Walsh's trade value. And Troy was upset about it. He wasn't happy at all. Yeah. And obviously I couldn't go to Steve Walsh and say, you're our guy, because I knew yeah. that Troy was really our franchise quarterback. Uh, but after I traded Steve, uh, then I was able to bond that relationship with Troy. Uh, so that first year was difficult. Um, and it was difficult for one reason. We didn't have a lot of players. But, you know, the other thing, Tony – uh, we had such a great assistant coach, uh, assistant, a group of assistant coaches. Yeah. You know, of course, Wanstead and Butch and, you know, you know, Tony Wise. Tony Wise never gets the credit for what, you know, he did. Great you know, coach. A lot of people look at, you know, the, the offensive line back then and said maybe the greatest offensive line uh, in, in NFL history. Well, there's no first and second rounders in that group. We had a free agent, you know, Mark Two and a, a, a defensive player that we moved to the left tackle. Uh, we had Nate Newton, the previous staff said, hey, get rid of him. He's too fat. Uh, 
we had an undersized offensive guard, a third round pick from Pitt. And I talked to Tony. I said, can you make him into a center? He said, coach, he said, you draft him. He said, I'll move him to center. I can make him into a center. He ended up being a great player for us. And then you know, we had Kevin Golgan, a seventh round pick that we moved to guard. And we had Eric Williams, a third round pick you know, from Central State of Ohio at right tackle. There's no first and second rounders in there. Yeah. Bunch yeah. of free agents, you know, bunch of third rounders. But Tony Wise developed that bunch. And just an example of the great assistant coaches that we had. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously that doesn't get the headlines, but I personally was part of privy to that, and and uh, and you know Tony Wise and all those players, and 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 I think that's the 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 greatness of what you're able to do. Yeah, the message that you send sometimes is a little harsh as players, but but you're able to find and navigate and find those guys that you don't have to go out because we all know, you know, this coach that. It's not made up of first and second round picks. It's all those other people, other guys are, are undrafted or in the latter part of the, you know, part of the, you know, the valuation of the draft. So I think that that's really when people talk about it, it's kind of misleading because you did have the system coaches were able to mold these guys and make them future Hall of Famers. You know, and, and Tony, I think a, a, another thing is, you know, it's, it's a matter of putting together the entire team. Uh, you know, we talk about the triplets being great players and we talk about us being number one in the NFL on defense, but it was just the combination of the whole thing. Uh, you know, a lot of the players that we picked were not necessarily, you know, household names, you know, you know, you know, just like for instance, you know, we did some things a little bit different. You know, we, we brought in, you know, linebackers that could run, you know, great speed. And then we had a rotation such as yourself in the was, defensive line. Yeah. You know, pe- people back then, you know, they didn't rotate the defensive line. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, just like Russell Maryland, you know, we worked out a deal. Russell was going to probably be picked in the fourth, fourth or uh, fifth pick. But, you know, maybe even later we worked out a deal with his agent, uh, Lee Steinberger, that if we ended up taking him number one, he'd make fourth or fifth, you know, pick money. And but because I knew Russell, I knew the type of person he was, and I wanted that rotation in the defensive line. You know, yourself, Jimmy Jones, Russell Maryland, you know, of course, picking up uh, Charles Haley, you know, to help us on the outside rush, Tolbert, you know, all those guys. You know, it really helped uh, having the rotation, and people didn't do it back then. But we did some things a little bit differently than what the NFL was accustomed to doing. Yeah, I think that you made it vogue with that rotation, and then it's a lot easier said than done because you still got to go out and get those players, and there was no salary cap, so it made it. But still, I just remember that it was like a it was like a boxing match, a UFC fight. You start at the beginning, at the very end, you got fresh guys. It's really just you know hammering home, uh, you know haymakers, but uh, just are tremendous. Um, and obviously, just the the way it kind of snowballed. I mean, I remember the game of the NFC division game against Detroit, and had pivoted into the next year uh, and then obviously won back-to-back Super Bowls. Um, I, I think the uh, when I when I got you on, I was going to bring up a couple of moments and the way you used to motivate. And uh, I I saw one, uh, I, you and Troy did uh, an interview, you did a show and you were talking about <laughs> coming back from the Washington game and we lost and no one, you, you didn't, we couldn't eat, the players could eat. But I got one for you, Coach. I don't know if you remember this. I don't know if it was 92 or 93 during training camp, during the freaking, you know, we were su- su- trying to survive all the fittest. And the special teams the week before in the preseason game were horrible. So the next day we show up and you're like, okay, everybody down on the goal line, we're all going to run down on kickoff on the kickoff team. Do you remember that? Right. And I'm oh, like, yeah. everyone. And I'm like, I'm like, coach, you're nuts, man. But then I kind of <laughs> understood. I look back, I'm like, he knew exactly what he was doing. That was one of those great Jimmy Johnson, like, Coach, what are you thinking? Well, yeah, you know, just, you know, just different things. I, yeah, I was. <laughs> Do you remember old, that? Do you remember that? I don't remember that. And, <laughs> and I remember what Troy was talking about, too. And, <laughs> I mean, you know, like I said, you're always looking, okay, how can you make this team better? Right. You know? You mentioned the Detroit game. Uh, after Detroit, if people will look at the comments I made 
in the Detroit locker room after we here it's our our uh, what uh, third year we beat Chicago in the playoffs and then right. we lost to Detroit in the playoffs. And in the locker room, I said we've got to improve our pass defense and pass rush. Well, that's when I traded for Charles Haley yeah. and drafted Kevin Smith and Darren Woodson uh, in for the defensive backfield. So that upgraded. Our, you know, we went from middle of the uh, pack to number one defense. Uh, and then you mentioned Troy. I, I said, you know, you know, <laughs> that's when we had the playoffs already wrapped up. And we're coming, you know, we went and flopped around, as you know, against Washington and lost a game we shouldn't have lost, even though it didn't hurt us in the standings. Right. And, you know, I told the flight attendant, you know, <laughs> you can serve the meal. I said, sit down. They don't it. <laughs> well, once that but I think we still, I think we still drank beer on that flight, coach. Or, no, uh, y'all were probably <laughs> going back and forth. I walking back there. Remember, I always walk back. Oh, there. yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. uh, if we lost the game, you better not have a smile on your face or be, or be playing cards. Um, but now, if we won, you could do anything you wanted to. Uh, I mean, you could celebrate. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, you all didn't need. But the next day, Wanstead came in my office and said, Coach, he said, God, weren't you a little bit tough on them? You know, really not even serving them a meal on the way home. That's a long trip. I said, Dave, I said, you know, I really, you know, obviously I want them to respect me and all that, but they don't have to like me, you know. Uh, all I want, I want to make a point that when we lose, I want them to be sick to their stomach. I want them to be upset. I want them to be mad. You know, I want them to be nauseated. I don't want them to accept losing. Uh, and then we win, you can do anything, no holes barred. Uh, but running those sprints, you know, when we, you know, one thing about special teams, you know, yeah, that's why I involved our entire football team on special teams. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's a matter of reaction. And, and so that's why I had y'all sprint down the field and maybe react to a punt returner, you know, to be able to go laterally and, and to make a football move type thing. And plus, it was a great conditioning drill, too. And maybe y'all were upset at me. I'm sure you were because you were trying to survive in training camp. Uh, but uh, it was a great conditioner. And it was making a point, hey, we got to upgrade our special teams and we got to play a lot better than what we did. Well, I can say this, special teams are better than next week. <laughs> so the message like, oh, resonated. It's get better, Tony. <laughs> uh, and I just remember the, the whole, the practice. And it, it's great to tell the generation now the stories of when we, back in the 90s when we played. And, and I just remember the, the intensity. And, Although, you know, for me, when I came from Atlanta to me, it, it, it re, you know, reinvented my career. And I'm like, man, I, 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 I love the, the whole dynamic because if a coach is going to have that philosophy, and you know this, if that's the way they're going to coach you, they're going to coach you hard. At the end of the day, there's got to be something, a goal that we're going to be able to achieve. And I think everyone realized that. And I've seen you, I've heard you mention it so, so many times how the players were so unselfish. It didn't matter who it was because in a way, the way you, the Jimmy way that you, you, you dealt with them, they got the same message as the other guy. Well, like I said, you know, when you have success, there's glory for us all. And, you know, like for instance, you know, you know, Troy Aikman, you know, if we would have thrown the football every down, you know, Troy could have put up huge numbers throwing the football. Uh, but, we had a great team we knew we had a great defense and there was no reason to really put ourselves in jeopardy and possibly turn the ball over. Uh, so we were, you know, pretty conservative on, on mm -hmm. offense. Uh, but, you know, as a team, you know, we could always dominate, you know, people say, well, you know, Troy didn't have a whole lot of comebacks. <laughs> well, he didn't have a whole lot of comebacks for the simple reason we didn't get behind. Right. <laughs> I mean, don't you love that, how you have to validate that? <laughs> if you're playing great defense and you're running the football and you're not turning it over, uh, you don't have to come from behind. Uh, but, you know, we had a great, you know, a great team philosophy. And like you say, you know, players were very unselfish. You know, they weren't concerned, concerned about how many yards they threw for or how many catches they had or how many tackles they had. As long as the team won, we were all happy. 
Yeah, obviously you went to Miami, and then obviously you were there for, what, six years in Miami? Three and then- or four. I was there four years. We went to playoffs three straight years. Oh, that's that's right. I, yeah, I, yeah. You went, but I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty. Yeah, a great uh, success there. And you had one of the greats here in Dan Marino. Obviously, he was kind of in the twilight of his career, but still had the number one offense. Defense is kind of where you needed defense. to. Number one Literally defense. Defense. Yep. Okay, and defense. Offense maybe not, but uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. So we mentioned Troy Eggman. And Dan Marino, those two guys in their prime, if you had to pick one of those quarterbacks to start your team, who would that be? And look, I know it's one of those questions. I know, but I mean, oh, no, think it, it, about it, that. Think about it, Dan Marino, it, it, how great it, he was and, and went to one Super Bowl and didn't win. Yeah, it, here's the problem. You know, you know, when I you know took over the job with the Dolphins, Dan had had so many surgeries. Um, he had really a difficult time moving around and, in fact, was hurt almost every year that I was with the Dolphins. Mm-hmm. First year, you know, they hurt his, uh, I think he, maybe his Achilles tendon. Uh, it hurt his uh, shoulder one year, uh, missed six or seven games. So he missed, you know, he missed time the entire time because by the time I got there, he was just so beat up. Uh, it was difficult for him to perform, you know, at a high level. And I mean, we did lead the league in defense. And, you know, Jason Taylor and Zach Thomas and uh, Patrick Sertan and, and uh, Terrell Buckley. Uh, oh, yeah, you had some tremendous talent on that defensive. Yeah. We had some great defensive players. But, you know, really we struggled on offense a little right. bit. Like I said, we won a couple of playoff games. The only disappointment is we didn't win a Super Bowl. Uh, and And that was a – disappointment for me because we had a great owner in Wayne Heising and, you know, he was willing to do whatever. All right. uh, but yeah, it, it, we ran its course and then I said, Hey, I want to get with my family and retire. So I just assume that you're, you you would go with Troy. Oh, I, I, I think, you know, I go with Troy you know, because I had <laughs> Kelsey and he was the best. Which, yeah. if, if I'd had Dan at his very best, uh, when he was healthy, maybe I'd gone with Dan, but I never saw Dan at his best. Yeah, I understand that. Um, and, and one of the things you mentioned is that you decided that you were going to get out of football and and spend more time with your family. And, and I just know the way you coached, it was it was it was full throttle. Uh, you know, the grind zone and everything that went into your energy and just all of your life was that. Was that part of the reason because just being able to get away from the game, you've been in it for so long, and uh, it's something that really emotionally drains on you because as a, as a coach, I mean, that's yeah. your life, and sometimes well, family you know, is second. Lot, you know, a lot of coaches could delegate and, you know, go home, uh, you know, at dinner time or at night. I, I couldn't do that. If there was a job to be done, I was going to work until we got the job done. And I always felt like I'd out, I could outwork people and, mm-hmm. and make us better. Um, the other thing is I was in charge of personnel. And so, you know, a lot of coaches aren't that involved with personnel. So they have an off season. Well, you know, like I said earlier, as soon as we won that first Super Bowl, I was on the road looking at players again, getting ready for the draft. Uh, and so doing personnel and coaching – uh, you know, it's a, a round the clock, you know, 24 hours, you know, 12 months out of the year. Um, and I, I spent very little time with my family. I, my two sons both played football. Um, I never saw either one of them play a game. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, my youngest son struggled for about 10 years, and, and, and now he's just doing fantastic. He has a couple of rehab centers. Uh, a very successful one there in St. Petersburg, Tranquil Shores, and he's now opening up one outside of Austin, uh, Cedo Ranch. And so he's doing fantastic now. And then my, my oldest son, his wife was CEO of uh, Airbnb, and she retired, and they're living outside of Austin. So my family's doing great. But but it, it hit me you know, when I was in Dallas, and then I said, well, maybe I'm going to make another run, go back with the Dolphins. Uh, but then um, – my last year, my mother passed away, and I went to her funeral. And I said, you know, I just missed so much time with yeah. my family. I said, you know, I've just got to retire. I can't work around the clock like I used to. And uh, and so that's why I retired from football. 
Yeah, it makes you think about those type of you know type of things. Um, so I, I got to ask you this. I think you probably there's no telling how many times been asked. So the whole contentions, you know, whenever you decided to leave Dallas and the whole the the breakup with Jerry, uh, how much was that of you, and how much of that was Jerry? I, you said that you coached there for five years, and it's kind of like you know, you know your energy, and like I'm done with it, but. How much of that was that you guys just couldn't coexist and it kind of ran its course? Oh, I, I think more than anything else. You know, Jerry and I both knew that, um, you know, as I wanted to move on. I, you mm-hmm. know, I wanted to move back to South Florida. You know, I loved living uh, in South Florida when I was at University of Miami. Uh, in fact, I, you know, even before the, um, the second Super Bowl, um, I'd bought a home in uh, the Keys, the Florida Keys down Kahiki Harbor. And so, yeah, I, I knew that I was going to move on and move mm-hmm. to South Florida. So it, yeah. it really wasn't, you know, a, a Jerry, Jerry and I had a great run, just like what Jerry said when, before we ever went to Dallas, uh, I, w- I remember like it was yesterday, I was in, um, in his SUV there in Little Rock, Arkansas. And he said, Jimmy, he said, listen, he said, I'll handle all the finances. You handle all the football. We'll go back to back and we'll make sports history. Well, that's what we did. Yeah, you did. Yeah. I got great yeah. respect for Jerry Jones. He, he, smartest businessman I've ever been around. He's very passionate about the Cowboys. Uh, he worked around the clock for them. Uh, and so, no, I got a tremendous amount of respect for Jerry. Yeah, that's, uh, man, that's, that's amazing that you're able to, to have that. Um, you know what? When we, when we look at the Cowboys and the, your whole coaching legacy, um, how do you want people to remember you? I know that's kind of cliche at times and people say, well, how do you want to be remembered? But if someone ever, you know, brings your name up, what do you, what do you want people to really remember the type of coach, the type of person you were? Oh, it, it, Tony, really, it's not a concern of mine. <laughs> they can think whatever they want to about me. As long yeah, as, I know, but that's right. I mean, as long as I'm at peace right here, I, I know yeah. what we were able to accomplish. Uh, I'm very, very proud of what we were able to accomplish. Uh, yeah. and, and people can form their own opinion of, of me. That's their business. That's not mine. <laughs> yeah, you can't really worry about that. And I much respect. I, last one when it related to the – so you, you, the, the biggest honor that you can get is being a pro, in a, inducted in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But not being in the, the Cowboys' ring of honor. Is that kind of like a side note now that you made you made it to the top of the mile when it comes to recognition of what you've done in your career? Is is it is it, it does it does it bother you any at all the fact that you're not being recognized as one of the you know the guy that built the franchise to ground up and won all the Super Bowls? And who knows if you would have stayed a couple more years, how many other rings they would have won? But I mean, does that really matter to you, Coach? Yeah, Tony, I, I think the media and you guys are more concerned about that than I am. I'm not concerned about it. I just think it's a great question because I think yeah. your ass should be in. That's what yeah. I, I yeah. mean. I don't, I, I don't have that. I'm just, yeah. I'm just making a, a bold, a, just a clear statement. I mean, right. there's no reason why you shouldn't be in. Uh, you know, Jerry's told me numerous times he was going to put me in the ring of honor. You know, you know, and like I said, you know, I'm not really concerned about it. You know, whenever Jerry has a good feeling and, uh, wants to do it, uh, that's fine with me. All right. So uh, I do a couple of segments on my show. Uh, kind of a fun version of the show. We'll get you out here real quick. We appreciate it. Uh, the first one is called X's and O's. And X's and O's is presented by Dr. Matt Chalmers of Chalmers Wellness in Frisco, Texas. All right, Coach. I'm so just going to ask you this, this, you know, like we're sitting on the, out on the boat having a couple of Heineken's. Uh, I read where you said being on Survivor was more stressful than winning Super Bowls and championships. And I, I, I love those shows, by the way. I love the one Naked and Afraid. Did you ever consider going on that one? Have you seen no, that one? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> that, was, that was a lot more difficult. <laughs> but your experience, I mean, you were the one that was like the guy that people had to worry about, that they voted you off. And But what was that whole experience? I mean, I got more respect. That's almost like, us going through training camp in freaking Austin. The, what what was your perception of that? 
Well, you know, I love watching the show. It's gotten a lot easier, you know, now. You know, in the early days, you know, it really was a, a survival show. Um, we had one little, you know, a little uh, bit of rice every day. I lost 18 pounds just in, wow. in a week and a half. And uh, So how I, produced is it? I mean, is it as hardcore as what you see uh, on TV? I said, how produced is it? Is it as hardcore as that we watch on TV? It, it, it's actually more difficult because okay. you, know, you, you really you have a lockdown period to where if the camera's not running, you you can't talk at all, and you can't you know because they don't want you to form an alliance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and there's a lot of times where you know you're in a truck going on a two-hour you know, drive, you know, and you can't talk, you're all hot, sweaty, mm -hmm. bugs fighting you. Uh, you go into the challenger or something. Wow, that's uh, that, no, that's the, tough. <laughs> the lack of food, the lack of food didn't bother me that much, you know. And losing all the weight, uh, getting you know just absolutely no sleep. You you don't have a change of clothes. You're soaking wet. It's pouring down rain. Bugs are biting you, and you're trying to sleep on some bamboo. So I, I couldn't get any sleep. Uh, but when it came time, you know, they were going to vote people out. I said, hey, you know. Uh, I'm not going to be offended. I'm ready to go get on the couch and, and have a cold beer. So. <laughs> uh, but I enjoyed the show. It was a great adventure. But the fact that you went on there was just, uh, I mean, I, those shows are made. All right, so favorite fishing story. You know, you, you're in the Keys, but if you have one particular story, whatever you caught or this experience you've had on the water, well, what is that? Well, um, I have caught – uh, and released, you know, five blue marlin uh, fishing alone. Um, my first blue marlin, I fought it, you know, for about two and a half, three hours out there by, by yourself. By myself, you know, running wow. the boat, probably a, probably about a three hundred pound blue marlin. And and actually, the the blue marlin normally you release a blue marlin, you know, just the sport of it. But this blue marlin did it, it died in, in the process, couldn't revive it. So I. I got it on the boat and we drug it through the door. And uh, it was like 10 o'clock in the morning by the time I finished because I'd gone out at daylight. And I sucked down about three Heineken lights on the way home and called my buddy and said, you got to believe, you got to see what I caught. But and since then, I've caught uh, four more and, and released them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's probably my best fishing story is my first Blue Marlin fishing alone. Man, that's amazing to do that yourself. I, mean, I, I, I caught my biggest fish was a yellowfin tuna. It's 100 pounds, and it kicked yeah. my rear end. But it wasn't just me. That's, a, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm sure you've had uh, some people that ask you to support. But if you had a fantasy dinner reservation you'd make for four, you know, whether dead or alive, and I, who would that be? Yeah, number one, you know, I, I very rarely go out to dinner. Uh, uh, if anything, I'm going to go to lunch with just my wife and I to where we're not bothered by people. Yeah. Uh, people lose their inhibitions at night <laughs> when you're having dinner. So I don't go out to dinner. So I'd probably, uh, I'd probably beg up. I, there's nobody I'd really care about having dinner with, to be honest with yeah. you. So how do you like your fish? You like, you like sushi? How do you, you, you know, whenever you, whenever you, how do you prepare your fish? Uh, I, my wife, I don't do any cooking. I don't barbecue. You just catch it. Like you just catch it, right? Cooking. And and uh, normally she'll have fried fish. Yeah, I, I go back to my growing up days. Everything was fried back then. Uh, next question. This is an easy one. Heineken or tequila? Heineken light, uh, fifty less calories than the regular Heineken. And then I, yeah, I, I very rarely. I mean, probably once every three or four years might have. Uh, hard liquor so it's Heineken light or nothing it's all like all right our last uh, segment with the uh, with the great Jimmy Johnson's Ben's Worthy Ben's Worthy presented by the University of Oklahoma's work center program all right coach it doesn't sound like you, you watch a lot of tv I mean you may be binging when you but over this whole pandemic by the way how did you navigate through the whole the the, the year and a half and, and still this the pandemic I mean how you know how hard was it and, that, and challenging was that well, the only thing it was a little bit challenging uh, was doing Fox NFL Sunday because normally I fly to, fly to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so with the COVID-19, uh, they set up a camera here in my office yeah. 
And so I did the show, you know, from home. Made it right. a lot easier because I'd do the show and then go into the den and watch all the ball games. Yeah. Uh, so I have to be going out to L.A. occasionally uh, this year. Yeah. Uh, so how about you? Anything you like to watch on TV? You read the book? I mean, like when you go to – because it's all we do is watch you know, Netflix and Hulu. Right. Any shows that you I, like to watch or you I recommend? Actually, I, I actually kind of got into uh, – uh, Chicago PD, you know, starting back at year one. Nice. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hey, I cannot thank you enough for having you know, being on my show and have you on my show. Uh, I just like to tell you all the gratitude I have for you for giving me the opportunity to come to Dallas, reinvented my, my career, gave me an opportunity to wear some hardware and be just a little part of your, what you're going to be doing in August, uh, going into the pro football hall of fame for that. Appreciate that, Coach. Well, Tony, I, I'll finish by saying, telling the story on you. All right, uh, go ahead. When you know, when I was able to trade for you, I talked to Ken Herrock when we were down at uh, St. Edwards, and I think we uh, we gave him a three going to a two uh, draft pick, uh, depending on your play time. And so I was monitoring that your play time your first year. And had I played you in that last regular season game, your playtime would have gone over. It had kicked in. I'd have had to give him a second round pick rather than a third round pick. And I, I, if you recall, I can't. Hey, you're just now. You're just now telling me that. I, I, yeah. I, 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 when I talked to you before that last ball game, I said, you know, I'm going to set you down in this ball game. Uh, that way, it'll save me a pick. And you were fine with it. That, uh, but I, re I remember that I didn't want to give up a second round pick. Uh, to Atlanta, and so that's why we set you in that last game. You know, I think it worked out for both of us, Coach, <laughs> but it's glad. But I thought that was Jerry. I thought that was his whole deal was trading and, and talking again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Take care. Stay safe. Okay. Love you, man. Okay.